Welcome everyone and um, good morning. This is the second webinar in the class knowledge uh, sharing program. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Simon Brook um, and I'm the Low Carbon Projects Manager for Electricity Northwest. Um, and in today's session, um, we're going to run through a very brief introduction of class just to recap um, following on from the first webinar that we did. And we're also joined by Dr. Vincent Thornley, who's going to talk uh, about the Siemens uh, activity on the project, and particularly looking at the voltage regulation technologies. Uh, Dr. Thornley will talk in particular about how the autonomous substation controller is interfacing with our existing equipment um, in our primary substations. Uh, and we'll explain how the class functionality is delivered from the Siemens equipment. <coughs> also joined by uh, Dr. David Permain from Impact Research, who is the Director of Advanced Methods. And David will talk us through the um, baseline survey that the class project has done in engagement with its customers. Uh, once those um, presentations are all finished, there will be an opportunity for questions and answers. We're an expectation that the presentations will take about 30 minutes, um, and then we've got 10 minutes of questions. Depending on the length of questions, we may run over the 40 minutes that we've allocated, but we'll see how we get on. And then just as a reminder, um, you've got the opportunity as we're running through the webinar to submit questions online, uh, or you can do it uh, via your telephone asking, to correct, asking questions directly at the end. Uh, so you've got both methods, and we will, where possible, try and do cover all of those questions uh, in, that, in that session. Um, CLASS is one of our innovation projects. It's a second tier uh, LCNF fund project, and it fits nicely uh, as, a, as a project into our innovation strategy. And Electricity Northwest's uh, innovation strategy is very simple to describe. It's about delivering value to our customers by maximizing the use of existing assets. And CLASS is a really good example of, uh, of this uh, innovation delivery. It looks at taking uh, existing proven technology, uh, using it uh, in a clever way, um, retrofitted onto our network to give the opportunity to solve some of the problems that we have now and will uh, likely have in the future and potentially gives us the opportunity to offer new services uh, to a whole range of different customers, uh, particularly National Grid. And I'll say a bit more about that, as will the other speakers uh, later through the presentations. Just as background, uh, CLASS is one of the three um, second tier LCNF projects that we are currently uh, running. Um, our uh, EW website has a designated spot, so if you'd like to know anything more about the class uh, project or even our capacity to customers or smart street projects, then there is a wealth of information that you can access online. Uh, and by all means, you can uh, send any queries that you have via email to our, our project teams. So let's um, let's get into the detail of the class project. Um, uh, what is class trying to demonstrate? Well, very simply, what it's trying to demonstrate is that we can manage uh, demand by controlling uh, voltage. Uh, and for those electric, electrical engineers uh, out there today, we'll know that there is a relationship. But the real important bit about the class project is that we can actually deliver a demand response by controlling voltage without any impact on our customers. Uh, and that is a key deliverable uh, that we are trying to prove uh, as part of the project. Now, if I quickly run through the elements of class, um, the first um, output that we are trying to get from the class project is a demand reduction, uh, and in particular, a demand reduction at peak. The idea being that uh, if we can turn down the voltage at uh, system peak, we can reduce the demand on our assets, and therefore buy ourselves a, a window of opportunity for deferring those assets um, into the future. The second element of the class project is to see through the use of a 
demand reduction capability of whether we can provide any support to the national grid, whether that's uh, balancing demand and generation or whether that's uh, helping with uh, frequency response. And then the third element of the class project is uh, through the use of absorption of reactive power uh, by a technique that Dr. Thornley will talk in a bit more detail later on, uh, give um, an opportunity to the system operation, uh, sorry, the system operator national grid, the ability to control the voltage on that network when the generation uh, is high and demand is low on the national grid network. Now, if you listen to the uh, first webinar uh, where Steve Cox ran through the various elements of the project, uh, this slide just recaps where we're up to uh, as part of the delivery of the project. And what we will be talking to you today is about the, um, the technology that we've retrofitted into our substations and how that fits, how that delivers through the trials and the various outputs that we want to be able to prove and then uh, also how are we engaging with our customers and the, um, the survey materials and the details and the baseline study outputs that we've got to share with you today. So that's all I wanted to say as far as the, um, um, the introduction was concerned. I'm now going to hand over to um, Vincent Thornley from Siemens who will talk you through the uh, uh, the technology that's been applied at our, uh, at our primary substations. <coughs> okay. So, thank you, Simon, for that introduction. Um, and as you said, my name is Vincent Thornley, and I'm going to talk about technology. So, a brief description uh, or uh, overview of, of the subject I'll, I'll cover, a little of the introduction to, to how or to the functions that you're trying to, to deliver part of the project. I'm going to talk a, a little about the voltage load demand relationship that, that Simon um, introduced. Um, I'll talk about the tap stagger principle that we're using to, to provide the voltage control, the reactive um, power support. Uh, and then get into the substation arrangement, how we, we're delivering the technology on site, and then the functionality um, of the autonomous substation control. So, the functions and techniques that we're using um, are on the screen here, working from left to right. We start with customer need, in the broadest sense of the word, uh, National Grid is also a customer uh, for this project. Um, <coughs> finally, uh, moving on then, towards the right, the means of detection or activation of a different function, the action that we're carrying out, and then the effect on the network. So the, the, first, uh, the first function which we're, we're looking at is, is the balancing system security. That's, that's the, the, the need for, for this function. Um, and this is a, a function which is activated um, using a command from SCADA. Um, upon receipt of the activation signal, the equipment in the substation will adjust the AVC target voltage, and then the AVC relays will uh, adjust the tap changes on the transformers with the effect that the voltage will be raised or lowered, and which will cause an increase or reduction in the load. The second function is a frequency response function. Um, this is a, a function where the, the detection occurs on site because we, we require a fast acting function. Um, the action is, uh, well one of the actions is that we will adjust the target voltage, but we may also trip one of a pair of parallel transformers, and I'll describe that in more detail later, with the effect being that we can reduce the voltage and so reduce the and then the final function is the provision of reactive power or the uh, provision of a reactive load um, to assist in the management of voltage uh, at higher voltages. And again, this is uh, activated using a command from SCADA. The, effect, or the action is that we will stagger taps, which I'll describe shortly, 
uh, which will absorb VARs from the EHV network and so help to, to reduce the voltage as part of the voltage management of higher voltage networks. So, um, I want to discuss a little on voltage demand relationship. So, the graph you see here uh, describes the relationship of voltage and demand for different types of loads. If we start with the, the, the blue trace, which represents a constant resistance load, we'll see that as the voltage increases, so does the load. And as the voltage decreases, the load will decrease. And that's a, a squared relationship. Um, <coughs> if, if we look at the, at the green trace, that's a constant power load. And on this, the, um, the, the, the load uh, is invariant as the voltage changes. And we're beginning to see quite a number of these types of loads on the network in terms of uh, the likes of uh, switch mode power supply. Now, the, the actual load on the network is a mixture of these types of loads. Um, and a 50-50 mix is represented by the orange trace. And here we see um, a reduction in load uh, or in demand as the voltage is reduced and an increase as, as the voltage increases. Um, and part of the, uh, the work of the trial is to explore the, um, the exact relationship in different uh, substations uh, for different load mixes. Um, so we get an understanding of what the actual relationship is on the network. <coughs> now, this graph is, in, is showing the instantaneous effect. However, um, if we look at the graph here and consider the time impact, well, here we'll see that, that although we might get an instantaneous reduction, over time that reduction diminishes as uh, thermostat and feedback comes into play, which maybe switches on loads, uh, switches on loads earlier than otherwise would have would have occurred. So part of the the um, the, the uh, project will will examine how that how that changes over time. Okay, so now we'll move on to the tap stagger. And I hasten to add, this is, this is the most complex slide I use in the, in the presentation. And I'll try to explain um, what's happening here as I describe the slide. So at, at the bottom of the slide, we see, um, we see um, vectors representing a load current flowing from, uh, from a, a bus bar. And the, the purple vector represents the load through the left-hand transformer and the blue vector represents the load through the right-hand transformer. And then as we move up through the diagram, we see um, that, that those purple and blue uh, vectors repeated for each transformer with the, the solid lines indicating the load current through each transformer. And we also see um, a dashed line um, in opposite directions for each transformer. And this represents circulating current around the transformer. So if we tap up the transformer on the left and we tap down the transformer on the right, we will create a circulating current around those transformers, which is represented with those dashed vectors. As we move up to the primary side of the transformer, we will see the same, uh, same shape, the same relationship um, of current. But here, the, the sizes, the magnitude of those varies representing the fact that we are on different tap positions for each transformer. And then finally, as we, as we get to the top, the, the vectors are superimposed again with the solid lines representing the total load uh, of the substation as seen on the higher voltage network. But now we see um, effectively a spill of circulating current um, represented by the, the, the dashed line um, as seen by the higher voltage network. And because circulating current is uh, effectively a reactive current, what we have effectively created, created is an additional reactive load as seen by the, uh, the higher voltage network. So now if we move on to the substation arrangement, um, if we look at this diagram here, we'll see in the center the autonomous substation controller in the green box 
and this is new equipment that we will install as part of the project. Um, that communicates with the existing RTU on the site um, to receive commands from uh, the control desk and to issue status back to the control desk. Um, the ABC relay, um, we, we've used a mixture of existing relays and in some circumstances for some substations we have installed a new ABC relay. And the ASC needs to um, issue instructions to these ABC relays to adjust the target voltage and also to, to carry out the tap stagger. And it receives measurements from the ABC relays of voltage, of real and reactive power and of frequency. Um, the, the final area of communication within the substation is from the, the ASC to the circuit breakers. So it receives the circuit breaker status and it can issue trip and close commands to the circuit breakers. Although in this project um, only trip commands are issued. We also need to consider um, the the uh, con or consider how we retrofit to to substations. Uh, with in some substations, it's very easy where we have modern numerical uh, numeric relays and we communicate with them to adjust target voltages. However, some substations have older relays uh, where that's not possible. And so, in these substations, we use additional um, Argus 8 relays which have uh, two functions. The first is that they carry out the voltage and frequency measurements that we require. And the second, we use the output relays to adjust um, the tap on a, a multi-tap interposing VT, uh, which, which we show here. And what, what these interposing VTs do is it, they adjust the voltage seen by the ABC relays to fool them into effectively uh, moving their, their voltage set point. <coughs> so just briefly, uh, the, the, the photographs here show the installation. The main photograph shows the ASC uh, together with some MagTap ABC relays. And the photographs on the right um, show the Argus 8. And in the, the, the lower picture, the interposing VTs that we use to uh, uh, use with that solution. So I now want to, to turn to the actual ASC functionality and explain how it, it delivers the required responses on time. So first of all, um, the frequency response. Um, there are two responses, which we term primary and secondary response. Uh, so dealing with the secondary response first, this is a slow response. Um, and when the frequency reaches um, a set point, for instance 49.8 hertz, um, the ASC issues an adjustment of the ABC set point to the, to the, uh, the voltage set point to the ABC relay. Now, this can take some time to have an impact um, because of the time taken for tap changes to operate. So there is also a primary response, which is a fast response. Um, so this would typically have a lower set point, for instance, 49.7 hertz. And when the frequency falls to this point, um, the first thing we do is we trip one of the parallel pair of transformers. Um, tripping one of the parallel transformers effectively doubles the load in the other transformer, which, has, which doubles the voltage drop and hence has an instant effect on the voltage of the bus bar. We follow this up by reducing the set point on the ABC relay because we don't want the ABC relay to correct this voltage reduction. Of course, we need to carry out some checks before we do this. We need to ensure that the two transformers are in parallel. So we check the, uh, the bus section breaker um, and also the, uh, the, the, the both transformers are on load. Um, and we also need to make sure that, uh, that uh, the firm capacity is, is such that we can, we can um, take the load of the substation on a single transform. So <coughs> looking at the, the reactive power um, and the tap stack principle for, for managing the voltage, um, <coughs> this makes use of, of some of the functionality of the ABC relay. Um, 
it's not as simple as just tapping up one relay and tapping down the other relay. We need to maintain voltage regulation and also prevent the tap change from running away. So we, to introduce the circulating current that we require, and if you look at the, the, uh, the vector diagram on the lower right, um, we'll see the overall load provided by the substation and then the individual current in the two transformers. Um, the T1 representing the transformer on the right and T2 the transformer on the left. And you'll see the, the dotted line vectors which represent the circulating current. So what we do is we, we give um, a reactive power target to the ABC relay that allow them to um, encourage them towards to change their tap position to, to deliver this circulating current. And during this period, effective voltage regulation is maintained. <clears throat> so the final area, the, the, the load management um, uh, the function, um, this is split in two. There are some manual, uh, manual services, which are called from the control desk. Uh, this can be voltage boost and voltage reduction in two stages, which we call full and half. <coughs> Um, there is also an automatic function, which is a single stage of voltage reduction, so that if you look on the graph here, as the load reaches a set point, uh, or reaches a, a trigger point, the, um, the voltage, a voltage reduction is applied, and then you can see the effect of transforming tapping down over time, um, which would have the effect of, of delivering a voltage reduction. We can see the voltage reduction in the top trace. And after that, uh, sustained for a period, the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the voltage reduction can be removed again. <clears throat> okay, so finally, uh, just an overview um, of the, the autonomous substation controller. The functions which we're using here on the class project is a subset of what's available. Um, and um, the, the, the focus is on the frequency management, um, local voltage management and, and the reactive power to deliver uh, higher voltage uh, control. Um, and we do this through controlling circuit breakers and also the ABC, ABC relay set points. And I'm now going to hand over to David, who's going to talk about the class customer engagement. Okay, uh, thank you, Vincent. So in this last section, I'll be talking about the uh, market research work that's been done uh, in relation to the uh, class trials. Uh, I'm David Pearmain, Director of Advanced Methods of the Impact Research. The key question that we're aiming to answer is, uh, will or will not class be discernible to customers? Um, the, the hypothesis is that customers will not see, observe, notice an impact on the supply quality when the class innovative techniques are applied. The customer research has two broad components, qualitative, which uh, involve focus groups with customers, both domestic and INC. And the purpose of, of that exercise was to um, find the best way of explaining class to customers, um, see what sort of questions it raised or concerns, and uh, explore the best ways of uh, addressing those, and developing the materials that would help support that process. But what I'm going to talk about today is the quantitative element. So this is a large-scale um, survey that uh, runs throughout the um, times that the trials are occurring. And particularly today, I'll talk about the survey that we've conducted in advance of any of the trials taking part. Going forward, we then um, compare times when the trials are being applied and when they're not, and seeing what effect that might have on customer feedback. So where are we now at the moment? <clears throat> Up in the early part of the year, uh, we uh, gave a lot of thought to looking at the process for dealing with any customer inquiries that might relate to class. So if people do uh, contact uh, Electricity Northwest with concerns, um, they need to be sure that people are aware of what's happening with, with the trials. Also, we had to make sure they had sufficient number of people in our sample. So uh, quite a number of people came forward uh, once they started hearing about class, so, you know, 
uh, wanting to take part in, in uh, the surveys, which was great. But we needed to supplement that with some face-to-face uh, -face, uh, contacts, especially with households, to ensure that we had uh, sufficient numbers for our sample. And then uh, we also had to make sure, again, as part of that sort of dealing with customer inquiries, that we had effective briefing for all customer-facing employees, so people would know about class, what it would involve, um, you know, they could reassure people um, what, uh, what was happening. And now uh, what we've done is complete the baseline survey. So this is a 20-minute uh, interview that we've conducted with almost 500 domestic customers and 200 IC customers. And the purpose of this is to understand where are people uh, in advance of the trials. It's like what is the, the behavior, what is the um, perception of the service that people have now, and then how can we compare that to when the trials are taking place. The trials then begin in summer and we'll be uh, running surveys in parallel with that, sometimes when the trials are, are in action and sometimes when they're not, so that we can contrast the effect. And then we'll be reporting on that uh, in September. Uh, class then continues after that. There'll also be trials in the winter, and we'll be doing parallel uh, surveys with that as well and reporting on that uh, next year. So the people that we've talked to, as I mentioned, we had uh, almost 500 domestic customers and 200 INC customers. And the purpose here is to have a statistically robust sample so that any measures that we get from this research, we can then determine whether there has been a real material effect from the class trials. So the purpose of this survey, the survey that we've uh, registered reporting on now, first of all, uh, was to make sure we had sufficient people to take part in the, the surveys that are going to occur during the trials. And the important thing, of course, is that we're going back to the same people. So we had to ensure uh, that we had buy-in from them and they understood that we'll be uh, involving them for quite a period uh, you know, over the next year or so. We also had to make sure that they had all proper permissions so that um, the data we received from them, that we have permission to share that with Electricity Northwest um, and uh, to make sure that that's all properly organized. And then the survey itself, I say a 20-minute um, interview, and uh, this was composed of getting core information about who these people are, so their demographic data if they're domestic, or the details of their uh, company operations. And this will allow us later on to then to cut the information up and see how it might vary for key groups of customers. We also want the information on behavior, so what appliances do they have, how do they use them, when do they use them. Uh, what periods do they like to be on the premises so that they might actually be exposed to any potential effects of class. And then finally, their perception. So <coughs> what is their current level of satisfaction with the uh, supply that they receive at the moment? Um, what are their perceptions of any problems that uh, might occur? We also have some practical considerations. When's the best time to get hold of them when we want to interview them in the future? And then also just to reiterate to them that they, this is part of an ongoing process that we will be coming back to them and they are reimbursed uh, for taking part in this work. So going on to some of the results now that have come out of the survey, there's a lot of information here, but what I really want to emphasize uh, is this period in the middle where what we're reporting here is uh, the number of people that are saying that they're always or often in at this time. So in the periods of um, in, uh, early evening, Clearly, the majority of uh, our respondents are likely to be in, and therefore uh, likely to be exposed to any effects of class. And you can see there's other variations through the day, but that's, a, that's the core time. And then for INC customers, not surprisingly, that most of their time is during work hours. But again, even in the early evening, almost half say that they're always there, and over half say they're often or always there. So this um, gives us confidence that uh, when class is in operation, there's a good likelihood that if there are any effects, they will be noticed by uh, there's the opportunity for the majority of people to notice them. Uh, thinking about their perceptions, um, and it's, it's not a surprise because it's common to most utilities, but the level of current level of satisfaction is very high, and this compares well <coughs> if you look across other sort of uh, service-based operations, uh, any score that was a score of 8, 9, or 10, if you could get sort of three quarters of your people saying that, you'd, you'd be doing very well. So um, relative to that, uh, you can see that the satisfaction levels are very high, and particularly for uh, INC. But this is one of the measures that we're going to be looking at going forward, is if for any reason during the, when the trials are taking place, we see a substantial drop in, in either of these measures, then um, obviously that's an important finding, and we'll be uh, looking out for that. 
going down in a bit more detail, so you can see here, these are the scores from uh, 1 to 10. And summarized across the top, um, we've got the what we're calling the top uh, three box scores, so anything that's 8, 9, or 10. So you see those um, values of 88 and 94 percent. But looking further along, you can see there is a subgroup for which the level of satisfaction is considerably lower. And these are domestic customers who, for whatever reason, have had cause to contact Electricity Northwest, uh, presumably in relation to a fault or some other concern. Um, and that uh, could be a group that's particularly important to look at because they may be more sensitive as a result of uh, whatever experiences they've had. And one of the challenges for the research is to separate out how that satisfaction might vary as a result of the fault or the call handling as opposed to any specific effects from class. So, but what we're confident is that by fitting the, our future surveys into what we're calling control and test groups, i.e. those that experience that class and those that don't, that we will be able to isolate any possible class effect. Uh, so the headline figure here really, in excess of 40,000 appliances represented by this sample. So this is all the people in our uh, survey uh, talking about all the appliances they use. So the implication is that if there is any effect at all from class, then there should be a chance of picking it up on at least some of these uh, appliances. Now this is a, a key figure. Uh, one of the questions we've asked is to say that, um, have you noticed uh, any difference in any of your appliances in the last seven days? Uh, and we have almost 8% of customers saying that one or more of their appliances were slower or working less effectively in the last seven days. So this is a baseline figure. This is nothing to do with class because there haven't been any trials yet. But this is the, if you like, the base level of perception. And going forward, we'll want to see whether this uh, increases significantly uh, when the trials are, uh, are taking place. Um, and we'll also be able to break this down by the different types of appliances as well. We can also look at it the other way. Uh, there are a small portion of people um, saying that actually their appliances seem to be working quicker and more effectively. And when we've dug into this a bit, it tends to relate mainly to tungsten light bulbs, the kind of thing that people uh, might, might notice on a, a regular basis. So both of these figures will look at uh, whether these appear to change when the trials are taking place. Another one we do is to focus particularly on uh, one area we feel that people are most likely to notice any effect, if there is any, um, and that's the effect on their lighting. And here we can see that one in five say that at the moment they say that they notice occasional dimming or flickering or brightening of, of light, whereas in the INC customers, uh, almost nobody notices that, a very, very small uh, percentage. But again, this will be one of the measures we'll be looking at and seeing if there's any um, significant shift in this when the trials are taking place. So just to sum up what's coming out of the customer engagement, um, the first question we want to think about is do class participants have the opportunity to observe class tests? Um, obviously, we don't want to have situations where everybody's out when they're happening because we don't know if they'd observe any effect. But the reassuring thing is the majority of people are going to be in in the periods when um, class is taking place and the effects, of, if there are any, are most likely to happen and something about half of INC customers also uh, are likely to be on the premises. Also about a subgroup, so we talked about um, a group that had uh, caused to contact Electricity Northwest and, and may as a result be more sensitive to, to issues relating to their supply. But also um, there's a large proportion of people who um, have a medical related dependency on electricity. Um, and one in five of these are already known in what's called the uh, Priority Service Register, the PSR. But in fact, as many as two in five would be eligible for that. So that's people who are in one way or another quite dependent on particular um, electrical appliances. Uh, and just that dependency might heighten their awareness to any, any change that's, that, that might be going on. Um, and also it may be those particular types of appliances as well. So again, this is an area that we'll look at uh, specifically in our analysis going, going forward. Also, uh, what are customers currently observing? So we uh, raised that figure of uh, about 20% of people, of domestic customers, noticing dimming or flickering or brightening. And again, what we'll do going forward is to see whether that proportion changes uh, appreciably during the class trials. For uh, INC, it's only 5%, but again, we'll see if that, that changes. And then we also mentioned people uh, <coughs> believing that their appliance is working uh, more slowly and less effectively, and that's as many as, as 8%. It tends to... Uh, be highest on, on the kind of appliances you might expect, so electric showers, um, lighting, especially the old sort of tungsten light bulbs, and uh, the older types of television and cathode ray tubes. So we'll see again if there's an impact there, 
or indeed if, if there's a um, change in their perceived uh, improvement, which again relates mainly to lighting. And then finally, uh, customer satisfaction, can we measure the impact on satisfaction? Yes, but we'll be looking specifically at whether there are significant differences in these measures of satisfaction, um, both by looking at those households when the trials are on and also when they're not, to see if there is a, a shift in, in satisfaction. And uh, that's the key point, really, because we're structuring going forward the survey into uh, equal amounts of people who are exposed to trial and those that aren't, then if there are any differences, we will confidently say that it's down to class. But if they're not, we can be certain that we've at least allowed the opportunity for any effects to be measured. So I'll uh, finish there, and I'll hand back to uh, Simon Brook. Let me thank all the participants for uh, getting involved and sending your questions. I hope you found it very useful. Um, I hope we've uh, kept your interest all the way through today's session. I'd like to thank uh, the speakers, both David and Vincent. I think they did a fantastic job, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it as well, uh, listening online. So thank you very much, and uh, we'll see you either at one of our other knowledge sharing events or, or another class webinar in the future. Thank you.